Hello, and welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. In this podcast, we're going to have a talk with Bill Brooks, and we are going to name this podcast the 2021 International Residential Code, that's the IRC, and Energy Storage Systems, that's ESS, with Bill Brooks. That's BB, and I'm SW, Sean White. So some of the topics we're going to cover are the IRC requirements for energy storage system units to be less than 20 kilowatt hours with a three foot separation between the energy storage system units. And there's some exceptions there due to large scale fire testing. And that would be also known as UL 9540A. We're going to cover the distances from the energy storage systems to the windows of the garages and the living spaces. We're going to talk a little bit about soulsmart.org and how that affects PV systems. I know this is mostly going to be energy storage. We did cover that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about lithium ion batteries being not so good outside of a house in a cold place because lithium ion batteries don't work so well when it's freezing. And then we're going to finish up talking a little bit about NFPA 855, the standard for energy storage systems. On with the show. So when we talk about the 2021 IRC requirements, it says that the individual storage units can be no larger than 20 kilowatt hours, that's an upper limit, and that the individual units must be three feet apart unless closer arrangement is permitted due to large scale fire testing. Okay, so since this was originally recorded with visuals, I'm going to explain the picture that we're looking at right now. So what we have is two different 20 kilowatt hour energy storage units, and they're separated apart from each other. And they're each one foot from the inverter, and then the inverter, which is wider than a foot, is in the middle. So the energy storage units are more than three feet apart from each other. There's the one foot spaces on each side of the inverter plus the width of the inverter. So that qualifies for that three foot separation. And that means that we're not following the extra requirements of having large scale fire testing, which is UL 9540A. And so these are just the basic requirements. So let's just take, for instance, that large scale fire testing has not occurred with this particular product, this example product. Mm -hmm. Anybody we can think of. So one way to keep the storage units three feet apart is to put them on either side of the inverter. Everything has to be one foot away from it. So let's say the inverter requires a one foot gap. That's the manufacturer's instructions. And let's say the battery manufacturer might have a similar requirement. It's got to be a foot away from other things or whatever. Regardless, it doesn't matter because the inverter would control in this case. And then the two units would then have to be a minimum of three feet apart. And because of the width of the inverter in this example, they're going to be a little over three feet apart and so that would be the most compact that you could make this installation without any large-scale fire testing let's talk about this picture so now i'm going to describe this picture and what we have with this picture is we have two different 20 kilowatt hour energy storage units that are closer than three feet apart from each other so they are one foot apart from each other and so that means we have to kick in that 9540A large scale fire testing requirement. And what we're seeing in the picture too, besides, is we have two energy storage units that are a foot apart from each other. And then to the right of that, an inverter that is a foot away from that. And that's a common thing to do, but you just have to make sure that the inverter manufacturer and the energy storage manufacturer, when they got their product listed, that they also did UL 9540A large scale fire testing. Not to be confused with UL 9540, which is the energy storage system test. And another thing too that's a little bit confusing that we're talking about here is we're talking about the energy storage unit. And in these images, the inverter is a separate thing. So when they get listed to UL 9540, they're listed with an inverter and an energy storage unit. And so we could look at the LG Kim battery with a solar edge inverter. That is UL listed to 9540. And that is two separate things, two different things. So there is the energy storage unit. A lot of times we just call that the battery. And then there's the inverter. But sometimes you don't really have to worry about this inverter being separate when you have something like a Tesla Powerwall where the inverter is built into the energy storage unit. Okay, so now we're talking about this picture where the energy storage units are closer than three feet to each other. 
And let's say that the unit has been provided with large scale fire testing to show that the units can be installed as close as one foot apart. In fact, the Tesla Powerwall, they just put them right next to each other. Yeah. Right. So the Tesla Powerwall would be another example where they do a back to back or immediately next to each other. Touching each other pretty much. They have yeah, there's like a one inch gap or half inch gap and you have a separator that attaches the two together and you have electrical wires that go between, of course, to connect them. And you can do up to three. So they can do a double stack or a triple stack, they call it. And that's been fire tested. And so those each individual units, 13 or 14 kilowatt hours, and a triple stack would be 13 times three or a little over 40 kilowatt hours mm -hmm. in one stack. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, because they call it 13.6, I think, or something like that, three would be over 40, so you couldn't put it in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you go, well, it's really only 13. Okay. Take a few cells out of there. Those things really don't put out 13.6 anyway. But that's an example. That would be 40 kilowatt hours. So let's say this is not a Tesla battery because we're having one foot apart. Whatever. It could be two LG Chem units or something like that or BYD units. And this is the separation that was provided. And you can see that in this arrangement, I've given you the overall dimension of this arrangement is exactly the same as the overall dimension of putting on opposite sides with no fire testing. So we really haven't bought anything up to this point with a system of this size. And this is a pretty good size system. Very few residential, run of the mill residential systems will get larger than 40 kilowatt hours. You know, people that are wealthy and bigger homes and stuff like that will put in larger systems for sure. So let's look at the next picture. Okay, so visualize this next picture. This time we have four different 20 kilowatt hour energy storage units. That's 20 times four, that's 80 kilowatt hours. That's almost as much as my car. And so you remember this requirement where they each have to be three feet from each other. And so what we're gonna have in this image is an inverter that's right in the middle of all four of them. So we have two on each side. And in fact, the first picture that I described is just like what we have with the two energy storage units in the middle that are each one foot apart from the inverter. But then the two outer energy storage units are three feet away from the inner energy storage units. So pretty much, we have a lot of space taken up here because we have all those three foot requirements in between the energy storage units, plus the width of the energy storage units, plus the width of the inverter and the one foot from the inverter to the energy storage units. And what we end up here in this image is over 18 feet of space here. And so that's three feet minimum between each energy storage units according to the 2021 IRC, that's the International Residential Code, plus Plus, of course, we have the width of the equipment. Back to Bill. If you didn't have large scale fire testing and you wanted to put in four units, well, that's really gonna hurt you because the separation required for the two outer units is gonna make this whole thing over 18 feet from end to end. And very few garages are even have an open wall that far. You know, that's really huge open wall. Now, you might be able to plan it nicely so that three foot gap that you see in between the batteries would be a window to the outside and a garage because a lot of garages have side windows and there is no stipulation on how close to a garage window you could be. So you could put batteries on either side of a garage window and probably make this work, but it's challenging at best. It's a pain in the ass. And you said a garage window because it can't be a, like a window of a living space. Correct, it can't go into the living space. And so let's just say you did large scale fire testing allowed for one foot gap. Now I can cut that space down from over 18 feet down just over 14 feet. So that's four feet that I've gained in that. That's a pretty big win for this large scale fire testing. And we already mentioned that the Tesla has the ability to put these units back to back. And so you could do two double stacks and I'm not sure how far apart those have to be. There is some stipulation on how far apart the double stacks would have to be, but it's not very far. So that would be probably the most compact system that I'm aware of today and they're using large scale fire. And this seems like a huge residential energy storage system, but my car's got more than that. That's right. A Tesla 85 kilowatt hour battery is larger than this. But I can't backfeed the grid with it because not yet. Somebody is not fair. That's right. So this is the National Simplified Permit ESS yeah. commentary. What is that? Soul Smart which is a certification program for communities, has permitting guidelines for PV. Yeah, that, and I've that seen I, that, and that's kind of the next step to the solar ABCs Correct. certified permit process. Yep. 
So just a little preview of the next couple of things that Bill's gonna talk about is that these are things that he is developing. He put together the solar ABCs, which a lot of us have already worked with. He also is helping put together the SolSmart. And SolSmart already has permitting guidelines. You should check it out, solsmart.org for PV systems and he's developing the energy storage guidelines. So just know that these are good ideas and this is just part of the process of how things work and how the code gets developed. And so I'm developing the ESS permit guidelines for the same program. And this is all in the documentation that we're putting together for that. So that's where this comes from. And also it's even informed some of the language that's going into the proposals for the 2024 IRC. So they took a lot of this stuff. I sent it to the guys that were working on it and they used some of the things like if I put the batteries more than 48 inches off the floor, then they don't require vehicle mm -hmm. protection. Are you seeing pe people using the Soul Smart stuff like for the expedited permit processing for the PV and the energy storage these days? Or? For PV, we don't have the energy storage uh -huh. stuff out there yet. I mean, I've been there and I looked at it and it doesn't seem to have some of the stuff that you did have at Solar ABCs. Do, do people go back and forth? You mean like the temperature numbers yeah, like and the stuff like that? Yeah, the temperature numbers and all that. Yeah, it has references to those places. Mm -hmm. The basic guidelines are very similar, mm -hmm. just much more inclusive on structural requirements. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of information about structural requirements and it gets into what's called sheathing attached systems that are not actually screwing into the rafters or trusses. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole newer area where a lot of jurisdictions don't really, or they don't feel comfortable, you know, with anything related to that. And this is the only kind of official document that gets into those issues that's not specific to a manufacturer. Okay, let me describe this next image. And what we have on this image is an attached garage the garage has some windows and the house has some windows because people like windows on their houses. And then it has these yellow areas where we can put our energy storage systems. And there's so many windows on the house, there's barely any place to put an energy storage system on the outside of the house. And that's in the living space, but on the place where you don't live, because we don't usually live in our garages, then we just can't put it over the window, obviously, but we can put it up right next to the window around the garage. So this just limits where we can put an energy storage system on the outside of a house because of all the windows. And now Bill's going to talk about that. Here is an example of a house with an attached garage, and it's really intended to show the struggle of meeting this three foot from any door or window. And so there are doors and windows placed in this plan around the perimeter. And what you find is that the yellow places are the only places where you could actually install an energy storage system. And that's basically staying three feet away from doors or windows entering the living space. Now remember, doors or windows on the garage are not something we have to worry about. Now the door into the house from the garage is something we'll have to deal with and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if we're just talking about the exterior of the house, basically where on the exterior could you put an energy storage system, you're going to find that there's going to be whole sides of the house, like the fronts and backs of the houses where we typically have a lot of doors and windows, where you're opening to the front, to the street side, and you're opening to the back of the backyard, where there are so many doors and windows on our houses that there's no place anywhere that's three feet. So those are just kind of off the side. Now, because we put our houses close together, a lot of times our side windows and doors, there's more room. There's less doors and windows on the sides of houses when they're up against neighboring houses. So you're gonna find some places where you're three feet, but you also find three feet and three feet means you have to have, not only does there have to be six feet from between the windows, there has to be six feet plus the width of the equipment, right? To actually install anything. So let's say the equipment is two feet wide. The minimum space between two windows or a door and a window would have to be eight feet. And if you think about houses, there's not lots of places on houses where there's that kind of spacing. What if you were within one foot of a window? Is it the flames are gonna jump in the house or that's something? That's the concern. That's what the fire service is concerned about and that's what they drove home in the code process. And this actually went into NFPA 855, which is the standard for energy storage systems. It went into the residential section and we said, time out guys, you haven't even thought this through because this is a blanket requirement and it 
doesn't allow you as much flexibility on garages that you should have. And so that's why we changed the wording from any door or window to three feet from doors or windows entering the habitable spaces of the building. And so that was a significant improvement that I was involved with some of my colleagues to, to clarify that. So now you can see that the exterior of the garage, with the exception of obviously the garage door and a garage window or a garage side door, that becomes the places that you want to put a battery storage system on a house because there's way more room to do that. And typically our electrical services enter those areas anyway. So that's where we're gonna to have to make electrical connections. So it makes sense. And you want to incentivize people to install this equipment where you believe it's the safest and best. And that would be on the exterior of a garage if you're gonna put it outdoors. Now, of course, exterior of a house in general is a poor place to put a battery storage system in a cold climate. So you would not want to use lithium ion batteries in Minnesota on the outside of your house. That would be foolish. Yeah, you can't even charge them above steam for the most part. Exactly. So this next image that we're looking at looks very similar to the original image that we first looked at. And that was where we had two different 20 kilowatt hour energy storage units that had one foot space between them and the inverter in between, which made the space between the energy storage units, those are the batteries, at least three feet. But the other thing that we're looking at here, especially in this picture, is something that Bill's gonna be talking about is having those energy storage units be at least four feet over the ground. That's so you don't go into your garage and smash into it. So if it's four feet high, unless you have a Hummer or something really big that probably won't fit in your garage anyway, then you will clear the energy storage units and you'll just smash into something under those. So just drive carefully. So here's an example of a system where it looks remarkably like an LG Chem 10 kilowatt hour battery in size, but it's square. And let's say that square battery had to be three feet apart or whatever. And then we had to put it 48 inches off the floor to do it without vehicle protection. And so here's an example. And as long as the battery isn't super tall, then four feet off the floor is not a problem. And on an eight foot garage, four feet off the floor means that it couldn't be more than four feet tall. So another thing too is you were talking about this is just for the front of a car but not the side. Right. So we'll talk about that in the layout of the garage. Let's talk about the layout of the garage for a second. Yeah, let's keep it right there. Time for me to describe a different image. So this is an attached garage and we have two cars driving into it. A shorter car on the left with an orange box in front of it, which is where the energy storage system might go in front of the car, but the car has a parking curve in front of it. So that's one way from keeping that car from smashing into that energy storage system. Or you can have that energy storage system four feet above the ground. So if your car did smash into the wall, that it wouldn't hit that energy storage system because the front of a car should be below four feet off of the ground. So that's for the left shorter car. Then the right longer car is facing the door into the house. And so we need to stay three feet away from that door because any door or window going into the living space cannot have an energy storage system within three feet of that door or window. So we can't really put an energy storage system in front of that car, there's a door there. Then on the sides of both cars, there is the yellow box, which is the area where we can put the energy storage system. So there's less requirements because you're less likely to smash your car into the side wall very hard. On the left side, it's just one big long yellow stripe where we can put the energy storage system. And on the right wall, there is a window. So we can't put it right where the window is, obviously, because the window would be in the way or the energy storage system would be in the way of the window until they invent transparent energy storage systems. But then we can put the energy storage system right up next to the window. We don't have that three foot requirement because it's not a living space until your kid, when they're 50 years old, moves into your garage, which is going to be really common in about 30 years. Okay, so here's the driveway coming into a garage. The car on the right is a Tesla S that would be what Sean drives. And the car on the left is a Kia Nero that I drive. Okay, so just want to give you perspective. They're two different size cars. And so we know that we can't install energy storage within three feet of a door or window entering the living space. So the door from the garage into the house is a door into the living space. So we got to stay three feet away from that, which is also the arc on the other side of that door 
we have to stay away from that. So that constrains us from installing our energy storage into those locations. However, the large yellow locations are areas where it's on the sides of where the car is parked. So we don't have to have vehicle protection as we saw in the ICC bulletin, the ICC information that the sides of the garage are not considered places where it's exposed to vehicle damage. Now, there are jurisdictions that don't believe that. In fact, I've talked to yeah, them. Yeah, my mom just stepped in off the wall. Yeah. <laughs> and the question is, is it possible? Sure, it is possible. Is it likely? Eh, not likely. And I guess it's going to be less force of an impact. That's or... right. And things like that. And so the question is, how detailed do you get about this? And there are jurisdictions that say, well, I think people are going to run into these things. Well, I disagree. The ICC disagrees. They say that protection on things on the sidewall is optional. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that, you know, and at the end of the day, you want to encourage people to install this equipment. First of all, in general, like in the state of California and in many other states, we want to encourage people to put energy storage on their house because it's a resilience thing. It's a benefit to society. It's a benefit to them and it's also a benefit to society. Let's start with that. And so if we're going to want to encourage people to do the right thing and install energy storage and it has benefits, we want them to do it in the right places where it's the safest. And when we do it in the right places, we also want to provide incentives for them to do it in the right place. And by not putting extra requirements on barriers, that means that these side locations, which is exactly where we want people to put them, will be the places where it goes most often. And the area that's orange in this diagram is kind of the warning area next to the house, which is like, okay, wait a minute. If you're going to put it on that wall, you're obviously exposing it to a car. So we got to talk about how you're protecting it from vehicle damage. Well, you could use a parking curb. You know, the parking curb is usually going to go up I mean, you could drive your wheel up to it, right? Unless you have a low rider. That's right. So the idea is the parking curb has to be back from mm -hmm. the area where the overhang would actually could touch the. There's probably just some standard distance. That... Yeah. So it's going to be about three feet, something mm -hmm. like that. So you would want the parking curb back about three feet. Now you got to remember an energy storage system; they have different depths. So some of them are very narrow, like the power wall and the LG Cam, and BYD is very wide. You know, it's much wider. It's more like mm -hmm. a foot or so wide. And so each one is going to be different. And so whatever that distance is, you'd want to be back away from that. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the option of putting it up in the air. Now, for non-floor mounted energy storage or wall mounted energy storage then it gives us the option as long as it's not more than four feet tall that we could put a four foot tall or say three and a half foot tall device on the back wall and get the bottom of it above four feet going back to the example of lg cam the breakers and the fuses and everything like that are in the bottom right corner so putting up at four feet is actually an ideal location anyway other equipment might have weird placements or different placements of of disconnects that wouldn't work out as well for a, a high installation like that and therefore the parking curb might be the better alternative. Mm -hmm. So this is just trying to show different alternatives for the best location. If I were to think of throughout the United States, what's the best location that you could ever put an energy storage system in? I would say it would be an attached garage because of its temperature location is tempered for extreme temperature locations in the United States or some type of utility room inside the house. Mm -hmm. from a temperature control. Bit. Maybe what they should do too is they should crash test these batteries and then if they pass the crash test, then you can put them up on the wall. Well, that's, you joke, but those discussions have absolutely occurred. And certainly, as you might expect, Tesla had those discussions because these things are can be very constraining for them in their installations. And so mm -hmm. they're already doing large scale fire testing where they're actually catching the things on fire purposefully with an external fire source. You know, they're not catching on fire from internally, they're catching on fire from externally. And so if you're going to do that why not run a car into it i mean they run their cars yeah. you know they do crash testing on their cars so and they get like free publicity when they show the video on twitter think of it you could get double duty for your car crash tests you uh -huh. could crash a tesla into a power wall yeah. and get double for your duty it'd be yeah. awesome yeah yep. we're all talking about all this in relation to a building what about like building like a little battery shack or something are you still going to have all these space requirements from the door mm. of your battery shack that's only for batteries no not at all because yeah. keep in mind that's another really good reason why we put the stipulation that it's doors or windows entering the habitable space mm -hmm. 
okay, in entering the dwelling. We can build a shed for an energy storage system with no windows. Obviously, we'd have to have some kind of door to get in it, mm -hmm. but you could just, a tool shed. Yeah. It'd uh -huh. be totally fine. And you That's can put right. energy storage on the inside and the outside and everywhere. Exactly. In fact, we could even put it all on the inside and the outside of here, too. Correct. This is focusing on the inside. The other one was focusing on the outside. And so, like, if we were talking about commercial, do we follow similar rules? The rules in the IFC are different, but they still have that three-foot distance issue for spacing of 50 kilowatt hour units we talked about. Mm -hmm. But the doors or windows thing, unaware if that's a really a thing in the commercial building part. A lot of that stuff came from NFPA 855, and so we would have to look at the IFC to see if there's any additional stipulations along that line. And so I know we talked about 855 before, but like just mm -hmm. once again, there's no jurisdiction that's ever adopted it, correct? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of at this point. I think New York City talked about adopting it. There's nothing preventing a jurisdiction like New York or Chicago or LA from saying, this is the requirements that we're going to use for our battery systems. The fact that 855 was used to inform the fire code and the building code, these standards have a very real tendency to get requirements stuck into the codes that are commonly used. So the fire code and the building code, which are used routinely in the commercial industries are easily accessible by everybody. In fact, there's online versions that are free. And you can look at the 855 online as well. It's a much longer and involved one. And where you're going to see 855 employed is going to be for certain types of like utility size systems. So the utility may say that if it's not our own system, if a merchant is coming in to build a energy storage power plant to connect to our system, we're going to require that system since it's not well covered in some of these other standards, follow 855. So have you seen much mm. of that in your consulting and all that? A little Do bit. people following 855 or being I, required to? you got to remember that 855 is only less than three years old. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very young standard. And it's in revision right now. It's mm. in its first revision. And we've already pointed out a lot of problems with it, particularly in the residential chapter, chapter mm -hmm. 15, which had lots of things in it that were overly restrictive, that were people were trying to pull those things directly into the IRC and it was like time out guys this is not good we haven't had enough people look at this that are doing residential energy storage day in and day out and that's the problem is that you need to have the people that are actually doing it and understand the issues and so we did get a lot of good input in this last code cycle for the 2021 IRC that helped resolve a lot of the problems with 855 in that particular area and now we're going a step further where things like vehicle impact isn't called out well enough in the residential code Thanks for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. If you want to see the images that are from this podcast, take some classes at HeatSpring. You can go to heatspring.com forward slash S-E-A-N. That's how you get to all of my classes and bills in a lot of my classes there. Or you can go to solarsean.com. We have links to the heat spring classes and everything else. And there's lots of classes on energy storage and, of course, photovoltaics, NAPSEP, NAPSEP certification. We're approved by NAPSEP for pretty much all the classes that I do there. So go ahead and check it out. SolarShawn.com and there's free classes even on HeatSpring. Learn and get NAPSEP credit. Go for it. Get certified.